and then there are the people that do the mechanical calculation. How do you sell to the resiliency people? By the way, I don't want to use the word survivalist because that has memories of people with guns. You know, <laughs> Although, by the way, guns have a lot to do with it. And have you seen the ascendancy of the magazine Garden and Gun, or Gun and Garden? Isn't that the weirdest thing you ever saw? Gun and Garden? It's a fabulous magazine, I totally agree with you, because it's elegant survivalism. It's perfect. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely a brilliant magazine, Gun and Garden, and that's what it's about. Now, how do you present a solar panel? The way you say it, you know, there are the three ways. You know how you present to the, to the resilient person? You say, you buy a solar panel so you can bridge the brownouts. Bridge the brownouts. It's not the right thing to do. It's just when electricity becomes a little irregular, of which we know what that's like in New Orleans, and if you've ever left this country to any extent, or been to New York, or, you know, we've had power with failures. It's very nice to bridge the brownouts. But don't give me the ethical presentation of penance. Don't tell me that blue thing is cool. You know, don't give me the number about paying this off in eight years. That's ridiculous. Just talk to me about circling the wagon so that when things get rough, I have an easier time of it. And that is going to be the winner. Okay. And what we're doing in our practice is we are taking our communities that are already either designed or permitted or under construction and retrofitting them to be resilient. And the principal thing you do is you present an agricultural component. And I'm going to speak about that tomorrow. I'm going to speak about an agricultural component, both from an economic point of view, a marketing point of view, a pleasure point of view, you know, the fresh vegetables, and also a social point of view. It turns out that standing with a hoe in the garden is more sociable than sitting in a rocking chair in the porch. Okay? Because you have tomatoes to talk about. Uh, there's only so much you can talk about in a porch. So, this thing has locked. Let me unlock it and see what it lets. Okay, now, the last thing I want to talk about is government. Uh, and this is really, in a way, what's consuming more most of my time. And I think you might find this interesting because we're here for what Kunstler calls a long emergency. Okay, what's the role of government in a long emergency? Well, you can learn a lot from the short emergency that you all experience with Katrina and Rita. Like some of the positive and negative effects of these things, in fact, of these two events, can I think be extended and, uh, and, uh, and studied. One thing that is, uh, and, and this is, it's not collected in my mind, but let me, let me actually begin speaking a little bit about this, a little bit of what I saw. The first thing is that when there's a crisis, elected officials, are not the best people to make a decision because they're not trained to work in an emergency. They have a whole series of, of concerns, including what their citizens think, and they actually, what, what all of the charrettes that we did, or every charrette, was to a certain extent wasted, to a great extent wasted on mayors and city councils that were so traumatized themselves that they could not decide. And in the end, the only successes that we had or anybody had, was when the military stepped in. Okay, and the military can step in as they did in Biloxi. Probably, I hate what they did in Biloxi, they did nothing but build a casino, but the, the traumatized mayor of Biloxi, he, he, he actually retained a general, a retired general. And the general, I dealt with him, totally cool, totally calm, totally collected, it was a minor thing. While the mayor was going like this, eyes rolling, like that, I mean, their lives have been destroyed, the general had no problems. There is in this country as many retired flag officers and general officers as there are active. There are thousands of retired people perfectly trained. And what I would suggest is the next hurricane you have is twin them up with the mayors, pair them up. Now, I'm not talking about a military government or I'm not talking about, about MacArthur in Japan. I'm just talking about stiffening Okay, civil government for a limited period of time with people who are actually specialized and trained to stay cool and make decisions. And they're, they're, they're all around you. This is a military coast. The number of marine generals and the number of naval admirals and generals up and down is amazing. And the people who get anything done, the only people who got anything done in Louisiana is General Downer. 
okay, down in Baton Rouge, and if he had given, if he was given, if he had been given more to do, he would have gotten more of it done. And I see the Marine Generals, and I see the Admirals, wherever they intervene, they could get things done. So let's talk about that, you know, about that kind of citizen that we have. I'm not speaking about active duty military, which bothers some people, but just people who are now civilians again. Now, the second thing that happened was the nature of the charrettes. And the charrettes, there is, if you speak to the people, not to the people who pay for or did the charrettes, who are, they're incredibly rosy about the charrettes. If you speak to the people, there's a fantastic cynicism about the charrettes, the people. Now, what is it that happened? By the way, there are places like New Orleans that have had six charrettes. Six charrettes, they're undergoing their sixth charrette right now, okay? And um, counties, I mean, uh, parishes in Louisiana have had, you know, a couple of charrettes, many as three. And the schools have been everywhere, confusing the hell out of people, the architecture schools, pretending that they were real. Now, what happened to the charrettes? What happened was that people were really, really in, in bad shape. When we did the Mississippi charrette, you know, there wasn't a day when each one of us, and there were about 170 planners working in 11 cities, didn't burst into tears. You know, even tough guys like me, I burst into tears, you know, you know, at least once a day. It was just extraordinary. And those charrettes were therapeutic. And that's what needed to happen. They needed to know that they would make it, that things would be restored. The elected officials, very quickly, you know, the, and I worked more with the governor of Mississippi, actually hit the note perfectly. Okay, this is therapeutic. We're going to put you back. Okay. Then a little thing happened, which we're going to put you back better than ever. Okay. And that was the theme. And of course, in New Orleans, with this absolutely fantastic flourish, by the end, by the time an elected official, a councilwoman, or a councilman, or the mayor spoke, everybody was going to look like uh, Brad Pitt. The guys were going to look like Brad Pitt, and the women were going to choose Look, everybody's going to look like Naomi Campbell. And by the way, your sewer system was going to be fine, and your house was going to be back, and the schools were going to be great, and everything. And I fell into that, you know, against my better instincts. You know, since the setting was, was uh, uh, the tone was set by the elected officials, I too turned around and said, Madam, what would you like? And they said, well, I'd like a better sewer system. I said, oh, that's a good idea. Sewer system. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd like my house to be really resilient, and actually I want a bigger house. Oh, yeah, bigger house for everybody. And uh, what about the town of Delcom? Oh, we're flooding. Oh, would you like to move uphill? Sure, well, move the town of Delcom. <laughs> Delcom moves north, okay? Oh, you'd always want, you want a harbor? Harbor, no problem, harbor. How many harbors did we design? Harbor. <laughs> would you like a, and what shape harbor, would you like a yacht harbor, like the European ones, or would you like an industrial harbor, like the Americans? Or perhaps half-half, would you like a fishing fleet? So basically, we planners basically acted like waiters and waitresses. <laughs> Madam, oh, would you like a hamburger, and how would you like your hamburger? Would you like it with pickles? Or would you like the bun toasted? Uh, or perhaps a coleslaw on the side? It was exactly like that. All the planners taking orders. Now, an excuse. The excuse was, I never would have done this. Never. I'm not that kind of planner. But there was a little thing on the side, which maybe, just maybe, was true, which was the government had sent $6 billion down. <laughs> I've never had $6 billion. And that $6 billion was incredibly confusing. <laughs> you know, we really could pay for harbors and transit systems and everything else. But the problem was that everybody was seen to place it saw us write it down, saw it in print, and the hamburger didn't arrive. Okay, you have to understand that. Okay, there was no filtering. Every single damn thing that anybody ordered hit the report, and it wasn't delivered. Okay, it was like, this entire restaurant is a fraud? Like, what's up here? And that's what happened. And you can never do that again.